Hello, welcome to the Spiritual Gifts Podcast, an in-depth look at spiritual gifts and more by Barry Carroll. For more than 30 years, Barry has been passionate about spiritual gifts and has helped thousands of people discover their spiritual place in the church and community. We do not want anyone ignorant of what spiritual gifts can do in the church, and he is eager to share this message with you. Coming to you from sunny Florida, your host, Barry Carroll. Welcome to the Spiritual Gifts Podcast. Before we start today, I want to clarify two points from our first two podcasts. The first two podcasts and the third one comprise the Introduction to Spiritual Gifts podcast. Going forward, the podcast will be more directly pertaining to spiritual gifts. From the beginning, it was important that we understand some key principles. Make sure you listen to those two in this one, which actually could be the most important. Another question we entertained this past week is, this podcast for churches or for people? The answer to that is both. We are the church. However, we know church leaders and staff are determining groups that make a church a spiritual gift operated church or not. It is neither a quick nor an easy process unless everyone is unified, which takes, of course, some time. Helping individual people is faster. We hope to offer online classes soon, instructing people on discovering their God-given passion, their God-given spiritual gifts, and their God-given style. Today, we are going to talk about God's glory. We will look at it from several perspectives, including numerically, by definition, and examples of inspired action caused by it. We will present two Hall of Fame glory passages, and we will conclude with Bible verses that define for us a way to glorify God every day and every moment. So let's get started with how often glory is found in the Bible. In the New International Version, it's actually listed 285 times. The King James Version, 375 the American Standard Version, 419, and the RSV, 453. You saw those numbers going up. Marv Rosenthal in the 1990s preached three sermons on glory. He told this story. In anticipation of preparing a sermon on God's glory, I asked some friends to define glory for me. He wanted to see how believers commonly understood this important term. Some suggested that God received glory through the saving of souls. Others quoted verses that referred to the glory of God, but ventured no definition. A few thought that the glory of God related in some way to the holiness of God. These were vague responses and underscore the fact that the concept of God's glory is difficult for most of us to define clearly. We know that it is important, but there remains vagueness about it. Again, the question is asked, since the purpose for men and women's existence is to glorify God, what is the glory of God? In this three-night, three-part series, he answered the questions by defining glory. He said this, Men and women only see themselves as they really are when they first see God as he really is. And here it is. The intrinsic, eternal perfections of God, His glory, is the only platinum yardstick by which to measure life. Now, that's a mouthful right there. He went on, Here is the absolute standard by which every thought and deed may be appraised. And herein is the bedrock problem of the present hour of history. America has loosed herself from the moorings of God's word and now finds that she is hopelessly adrift in a broken craft with a storm brewing. What are the intrinsic eternal perfections of God? And what about this platinum yardstick? Marv Rosenthal introduced that platinum is a metal that doesn't shrink or doesn't expand with heat or cold or any other influence from the outside. It is what it is. And what Marv was saying regarding intrinsic, that word just means it is. You you can't add anything to it and can't 
take anything away either. It is what God is. The eternal perfections of God. I'm going to lean on A.W. Tozier and his book, The Knowledge of the Holies. I will put a link in the notes so that you can download this PDF and read it. It is an incredible book. I've read it many, many times. It just constantly is a book you want to have on your mind. In this book, what A.W. Tozier did was what Marv Rosenthal said was the eternal perfections of God, the characteristics of God. These are the chapters of the book that A.W. Tozier wrote. In chapter 2, it's God incomprehensible. In chapter 4, the Holy Trinity. Chapter 5, the self-existence of God, the self-sufficiency of God, the eternity of God, God's infinitude, the mutability of God, the divine omniscience, the wisdom of God, the omnipotence of God, the divine transcendence, God's omnipresence, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God. All of these are the intrinsic eternal perfections of God. And Marv Rosenthal said this, they all go forward or none go forward. We can be joyful for a moment and then not joyful later on. But in the case of God, all of these characteristics, he can be loving and just at the exact same time. That's why God is God and we're not. And it's just overwhelming to think about that. And all of that combined is the glory of God, according to what Marv Rosenthal is saying. Now let's move on to a definition, and we go to Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. Here's what Vine says. The glory of God is the revelation and manifestation of all that he has and is. That's those eternal perfections. Now I also took a look at the Encyclopedia of the Bible from BibleGateway.com. And if you're not familiar with BibleGateway.com, it's just an online Bible that when you pay $39.99, this is not an <laughs> advertisement for them. I'm just giving a tip to you that for $39.99, you can have Bible Gateway for a year and you have access to dozens and dozens of research documents including the Encyclopedia of the Bible. When we look at it from the Hebrew standpoint, there are 25 different words that we get the word glory. And so an example would be sometimes in the Bible it's used as a kingdom, and it refers to the armies and people. An example is found in Proverbs 14.28, the king of Assyria and all his glory. Well, that glory is referring to his soldiers and the massive amount of people that he had. Later in the encyclopedia, it referenced the glory of God, which is the point number two for them, and it says the major use of the word is to describe God's glory. Glory belongs to God intrinsically. Ah, the same word that Marv Rosenthal had used. The Lord's Prayer sums it up, thine is the glory, and we'll come back to that later on. Another point that is brought out in the Encyclopedia of the Bible is that God is that man and all creations should give glory to him. Man must not glory in his wisdom, might, or riches, but rather in understanding the Lord. That's from Jeremiah 9.23. He who boasts must boast of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 1.31. Man is expecting to show forth God's excellencies. That's 1 Peter 2.9. And that's summed up in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God. But what is glorifying God? Well, we know that they're the intrinsic eternal perfections. But we're going to move on to some verses that tell you what the actions caused by the glory. And the first was when Jesus was born. In Luke 2, 9, it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This is referencing the shepherds out in the field. 
So again, behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. What did they see? Maybe it was light. Maybe it was sound. Maybe it was uh, visuals that overwhelmed them. But their response to that was, and they were greatly afraid. So think about that. Somebody, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Was it on the ground? Was it in the air? A lot of times the illustrations are in their air. But could they have been on the ground? But anyway, whatever it was, it greatly, <laughs> they were greatly afraid. Amazing. In John 1, 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. So what they saw in Jesus, they knew came from God, just by looking at him, by the way that he helped himself. And finally then, the first miracle that Jesus did, which can be found in John 2, 11. And that was, of course, this was turning water to wine at the wedding. And it said, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So whatever the di disciples saw when he did that miracle, turning water to wine, maybe it was the way that Jesus related to them verbally, physically, whatever. But that issue, what they saw at that wedding, caused them to believe in him at that point. I mean, they had been with him at different times before that. It was a short time before it. But on that particular day, his disciples believed in him. And that's how this ties into spiritual gifts, because when you're using your spiritual gifts, people will come to Christ. Because that Holy Spirit that is in you, that has given you that special ability of a spiritual gift, prompts your heart to use that gift in an act of service, may very well bring people to Christ. And that's why I bring that in. And of course, the Lord's Prayer there that ends with, that's in Matthew 6, 13, for yours is the kingdom. Now, this is Jesus speaking, and he's teaching us how to pray this. So, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So again, as we read these and we think of glory, and we're supposed to glorify God through our spiritual gifts, well, there you have some examples of it. I know that you've heard these stories, the two, what I call, Hall of Fame passages of glory, where glory really comes through. One is Exodus 33, 12, and that's the Moses story when he speaks to God. He starts off in verse 12 of Exodus 33, Then Moses said to the Lord, and he's coming from a complaining standpoint too. Both of these are that way. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you, you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And God said back, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses says back, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, this is Moses speaking again, Please, show me your glory. Then God said back, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Now, this is interesting. We just talked about all the intrinsic perfections, and goodness was one of those in a long list. And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. It, because we know, and he even says it here. I'll go ahead and read it. I, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. 
So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass. Then I will take my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So Moses just gets a glimpse of God's glory. And of course, he went down from the mountain shortly thereafter, and people saw God's glory on his face. So if you can get that close to God, evidently, it shows on you. And that's what spiritual gifts, that's really what that is all about. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, and it gives us special abilities to serve God. And when we serve God, that is God's glory. Now, Isaiah 6.1, of course, this is probably one of my all-time favorites, in the year that King Uzziah died, and that's just a noteworthy of the time period where this took place, I saw the Lord, Isaiah says, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, of course, angels, as you may know, each with six wings. This always fascinated me when I was a young person. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. So their faces and their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> this is what Isaiah said. And think of Moses when he was complaining. Listen to what Isaiah says. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So here he is in that presence, and yet he is filthy. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. That is an amazing 180-degree change. That he knew that he was forgiven from his sins. And his response was, send me, I will do your work. And when you understand what your spiritual gift is, when you can discover on your own through some exercises we can give you to help you down that path, but you determine it yourself. You discover yourself what your God-given passion is, what your God-given gifts are, what your God-given style is, and the combination is your servant profile. When you determine that, you will see God's glory in that, and it will cause you to say, send me, I want to do this every day, all the time. It's a remarkable thing. My hope for you is that you understand God's glory in that kind of a way, that you will be like Isaiah and compelled to say, send me. Now, let's take a look at a few more verses. In John 17, 20, it says, this is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I mentioned this to you to help you understand what he said to the disciples and us. So here it is. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who, who will believe in me through their word. Now, we didn't hear directly from the disciples, but we've connected to the disciples' words down to us where we've accepted Christ. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And that's what we believe, that God sent Jesus to die for our sins. 
Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. That is a beautiful verse for us as Christians, as followers of Christ. Jesus made it possible. And remember, that which was put in us not only was belief, but also was the Holy Spirit. And that's what the spiritual gift has given us a special ability. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. John seven eighteen, He who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and righteousness is in him. And finally, we don't want anyone to, to have happened to them, is found in Acts twenty two twenty one. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in his royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God, not a man, the voice of a God, and not a man, the voice of a God, and not a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him dead because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. We want to be glorifying God. And the easiest and the best way to do that is to use the spiritual gift that God has given us, is to use the spiritual gift that God has put in us to serve people and glorify God through that process. The people will glorify God by what we do. So as we wrap up today's topic, Let me finish with four appropriate Bible verses and a few additional comments. Therefore, this is Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God. That's what happens. We do our good works using our spiritual gifts, and they glorify God. In 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10, and this puts it right together, actually, cheerfully share your home, that's the spiritual gift of hospitality he's speaking of, with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? We call that the spiritual gift of teaching. Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? That's the spiritual gift of helps. Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. Peter says it right there, plain and simple. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. And finally, the last verse, Luke 14.10. Jesus told a parable, and this was huge for me years ago, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, um, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit in the best place, lest one more honorable than you will be invited by him, and he, he who invited you will come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. This is an interesting thing that Jesus is saying. You go to a party and you take a good seat. And Jesus said, don't do that. 
because if the master wants to put somebody closer to him in that seat, well, that's an embarrassment, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. But, in verse 10, but when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher, then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. That's an interesting thing there. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We live our life in a way that we can bring positive attention to God in all that we do. I've simplified this, that in that case of going to this wedding, that Jesus says, remain humble, don't take the best seat, but let the person invite you up, and then that brings you glory. I think another word that could be said, that will bring you positive attention, And so that's why I use that when I say we live our life in a way that we bring positive attention to God in all that we do, and that is our way to glorify God in all things. And of course, the opposite of this is dishonoring God. So as Christians, we must never dishonor God in our actions, thoughts, and what we say. We are in the business to glorify God, and so think of it as constantly being a good example and positive example of the name of Jesus to our community. Our actions remind those we serve we love them, and that is glorifying to God. The reason we have spiritual gifts is to glorify God and edify others. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, We plead with you, encourage you, and urge you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in the kingdom and the glory. In coming months, you will be reminded how using your spiritual gifts brings God glory. We will show you how to bring glory to God every day of your life through your gifting. These experiences give you satisfaction and a type of fulfillment you cannot experience any other way. Once you experience using the spiritual gifts this way, you will be unstoppable in advancing the kingdom of God in your community. I hope you understand the two words, God's glory, and you will live the rest of your life doing what you can to bring God glory by serving as a positive force with your spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit deposited in you. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to make your face shine down on us. We want to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. You've been listening to the Spiritual Gifts Podcast, the glory of God's spiritual gift key. Next time, we will examine podcast number four, where we will hear what a church can be like. We hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a broadcast, you can always listen online. Our website is spiritualgiftspodcast.com. There, you can stream the program or download the MP3 for free. Again, that is spiritualgiftspodcast.com. Thank you for emailing this podcast to 5 to 10 family, friends, and church acquaintances who you think will enjoy it. Let us see if God will use you and me to change the direction our churches and country are traveling. Thanks for listening. We look forward to you coming back next time. May God bless you.